All right, you guys, this next episode of Paradigm Profiles is called How Shady Attempted to Silence Diablo and How the M is Silent Shady. Like the first half of this story, this second half has a lot of moving parts to it and there's a lot to cover. So as I mentioned in the first half of this story, Shady's first bid in prison was for a murder he committed with his brother Cherio. This incident took place on June 4th, 1986 in the Wilmington Housing Projects. An individual by the name of Ralph Morales was gunned down for what was originally said to be behind an altercation with Chirillo and Shady. The case was slipshod from the onset as it was based on flimsy witness accounts and testimony that the DA procured under questionable circumstances. The district attorney's principal witness, Edward Moran, turned out to be a convicted rapist who had a motive for concocting the story that was used to convict both Shady and Chirillo. He claimed that the victim, Ralph Morales, was shot in the head by Shady and then Chirillo also used that same gun to dome him a second time. However, his admission didn't come until three weeks later after he had been arrested for sales and possession of PCP. This revelation came on the heels of a major scandal that erupted in Los Angeles County over the use of jailhouse snitches who fabricated testimony in murder cases in order to receive reduced sentences. And Edward Moran, the same principal snitch that the district attorney used against Shady and Chirillo, was at the heart of that scandal. But the case against Shady and Chirillo had a scandal of its own. After the case was looked at by an appellate attorney, this attorney discovered that not only did the district attorney fail to disclose that Moran was promised a reduction in time for providing testimony, but it was also discovered that the district attorney allowed Moran to take furloughs from the LA County Jail during the trial. There was definitely some frivolous shit going on with the DA who prosecuted the case, but this appellate attorney knew that this would work in Shady and Chirillo's favor. This whole case hinged on Moran and his testimony. A convicted rapist and drug dealer who didn't tell the cops that he had witnessed the murder until three weeks after it happened, when he himself had been arrested for possession of PCP, thus then giving him a motive to lie. The media ran with the story as soon as it was discovered that Shady and Chorillo both had substantial ties to the Mexican Mafia. The implication was that the killing of Morales was an orchestrated attempt by the Mexican Mafia to take over the drug trade in the Wilmington Projects. They went on trial in Los Angeles County Superior Court in September of 1987. Moran was the only witness who testified that he saw the Grajeda brothers shoot Morales. On October 2, 1987, a jury convicted Shady and Chirillo of murder, but acquitted them of armed robbery. Shady was sentenced to 32 years to life in prison. Chirillo was sentenced to 45 years to life. Less than two weeks later, Moran pleaded guilty to possession of PCP and the gun charges against him were dismissed. He was sentenced to one year in jail and then released, having been in jail from the time he was arrested in June of 1986. This is when Shady was propositioned by an appellate attorney named Robert Burke. Burke was the same appellate attorney who discovered the DA's misconduct and that the case was hinged on some serious problems. Burke wanted to do his due diligence by rightfully getting the case thrown out for the Grajeda brothers, but there was something else motivating him and he intended on using this to help him route out the case. He had a personal axe to grind with the prosecutor who tried the case. This particular prosecutor was allegedly involved in a sordid affair with his wife. So Burke had personal reasons for wanting to attack the case and get it thrown out. He wanted to beat his nemesis and he wanted to be the one to expose his aspersions in a case of this magnitude. A case with political implications and a case that would definitely get aired out in the media at the very least on a statewide level. So in June of 1990, a state petition for a writ of habeas corpus was filed on behalf of Shady Grajeda. His lawyers sought a new trial based on the fact that the DA filed to disclose that Moran, their witness, was promised a reduced sentence and that he was being allowed to take furloughs from the county jail during the trial. This was all done in exchange for his testimony against the Grajadas. This ended up turning into a big scandal, but they basically bought Moran's testimony. The DA obviously knew he was caught, and in an effort to placate damage control, he didn't oppose the petition. In fact, he submitted a request to the 2nd District California Court of Appeals himself as the prosecuting attorney, requesting that the habeas petition be granted. The court agreed, and as a result, almost 10 months later, in April of 1991, 
the charges against Shady Grajeda were dismissed. However, he remained in prison until May 18th of 1993 because he had been convicted of possession of a weapon in prison. He's actually lucky he didn't go all in and pick up a grip of time before his appeal went through. I did time with a couple of guys who originally went to prison on life cases and then ended up picking up additional life cases because they figured they had nothing to lose. Later on, their original controlling life sentences ended up getting thrown out on appeal, but by then it was too late. They had picked up additional life sentences and never made it back out. So on that front, Shady was lucky. Cherio also filed a state petition for a writ of habeas corpus, which was granted. He went on trial a second time in 1993 and was acquitted. As I mentioned in the first part of this story, Shady and Diablo linked up during a point in time when Diablo was already well into his killing spree. Diablo's fourth, fifth, and sixth murders occurred after these two linked up and started pushing the Mexican Mafia's will. I've pointed this out before, but for the purpose of this story, let me just say this with respects to the street vision shared by both the NF and the Mexican Mafia. Although the Mexican Mafia and their subordinates who elect to function on the streets operate a little different, there's still a lot of parallels and similarities that make their street functions similar to the NF's. They obviously don't refer to their crews as street regiments and they don't utilize terminology reflective of being established under a paramilitary structure. But again, there's a lot of parallels that are similar based on the fact that they share the same vision. To generate money, to break new ground, to continue expanding, and to maintain the ability to be self-supporting and self-sustaining. Like the Nuestra Familia, the Mexican Mafia obviously has some type of system in effect that allows them to keep track and maintain a list of all those members who have paroled and all those who have expressed an interest in working on the streets. In the same context, you got guys who want to get out, pick up a lunch pail, and fly straight with no intention whatsoever on involving themselves in any type of criminal activity. And then you got guys who have expressed a desire to assist in the street functions, who want to be involved in the building process, knowing good and well that they're going to be involved in criminal activity. Point being, Shady was well aware of the fact that Diablo was out there running around in the Wilmington and San Pedro areas long before he got out himself. Not only because of some of the people he was shaking up, but also because of the contracts he picked up on both Big Weddle and Diablo. Part of that contract obviously consisted of knowing where Diablo was and what he was doing out there on the streets. According to Puppet, at one point, Shady was out there trying to locate Diablo. Not just for the purpose of fulfilling the contract, but also because Diablo had the means to assist Shady in taking out Big Weddle as well. Nobody needed to see clearance from Sleepy from Eastside We Must, but Puppet said that at one point, Sleepy was consulted about the green light that was placed on Diablo. Probably more so out of respect since he was from Eastside Wimas himself. As I said in the first part of this story, Sleepy was one of a few well-respected Mexican Mafia members from Eastside Wimas who garnered a lot of influence and respect in that organization. As I said in the first part of this story, Sleepy was one of a few well-respected Mexican Mafia members from Eastside Wimas who garnered a lot of influence and respect in that organization. Not only because of his status as a senior member, but also because of his intellectual stature and his leadership abilities. At one point, Sleepy along with Weddle Sherm from Shelltown, Weddle Caballo from Eastside 18th Street, and Popeye from Harpies were all involved with creating the Mexican Mafia's MESA system. The MESA system functions on the premise that Sureños were at one time betterly suited to execute the intricacies of a prison mainline rather than Mexican Mafia members themselves who were housed a thousand miles away in Pelican Bay Shoe with little or no communication or immediate monitoring capability. This was obviously during a time when everyone was still stranded in the shoe, but they were the creators nonetheless. Prior to the implementation of the MESA system, Sureños were required to write a Mexican Mafia member and request permission to run a prison yard. These four innovators proved to be pioneers in the cultivation and integration of contemporary and creative business models into the structure of the MS criminal enterprise. But Sleepy really made his mark and proved his loyalty on May 17, 1988, when he took out longtime Mexican Mafia member Nick Nico Velasquez in Tehachapi State Prison. Nico, who was serving a life sentence for first-degree murder, had expressed reservations for performing hits and had been observed reading the Bible on a daily basis, something that is considered to be a contradiction to the MS criminal philosophy. 
According to documented reports, Sleepy hit Nico one time in the heart, catching him off guard while Nico was urinating at the baño. <laughs> Cold piece of work. Hit this man while he was taking a leak. This earned Sleepy the nickname, The Professional. According to Sleepy, who successfully mounted a self-defense claim and was never charged for the murder, Nico's last words in a sad tone were, Oh no. According to Sleepy, who successfully mounted a self-defense claim and was never charged for the murder, Nico's last words in a sad tone were, Oh no. Anyways, on July 1st, 1997, Shady finally succeeded in carrying out the contract on Big Weddle Dunton. This was obviously done with Diablo's assistance, but during the actual killing of Big Weddle and another guy who used to buy dope from him, Robert Spider Acosta, things kind of got a little sketchy. Spider and Weddle had been friends for close to 30 years, and Spider was moving dope for Weddle. Ironically, Spider apparently had a premonition that ended up coming true. A few weeks before they would both be shot and killed, Spider Acosta told Weddle that he didn't trust Diablo and to be careful letting him inside his pad. Apparently, Spider had been hearing about other people who had been victimized by Diablo, and some of these people had been good to him and had helped him in the past. But unfortunately for Spider, he didn't take heed to his own gut feeling. Big Weddle was moving a lot of dope in Harbor City, West Carson, Wilmington, and the San Pedro areas. He sold most of it directly out of his house, and then on top of that, he had several runners who would come by, re-up, and then sling it in different places around the Harbor area. Big Weddle weighed close to 400 pounds, but he wasn't an imposing figure with an intimidating presence. Instead, he was extremely obese, he had a lot of health problems, and he barely had any mobility. His legs were always swollen as a result of diabetes and poor circulation, and he spent most of his time at home because it was an arduous task just to move around. Right now, you should be looking at an actual picture of Weddle's living room. I had to crop it as it showed the bodies of Weddle and Spider Acosta but this is actually where the murders would later occur. When it came to the Mexican Mafia and the taxes that were imposed on him, he was very vocal about the fact that he didn't like it, but he fell well short of ever saying anything disrespectful and he knew where those boundaries were. Weddle was one of those types of guys who felt like criminal organizations like the Mexican Mafia or the Nuestra Familia were interlopers, prison politicians who put prison politics before the neighborhood. Guys who lost all the love they once had for their neighborhoods and instead became interlopers, brainwashed into pushing a political agenda that proved to be detrimental to the hood. But at the end of the day, no matter how much he whined, complained, and drug his feet, he always complied. However, over the course of time, he had been warned and admonished by a number of different Mexican Mafia enforcers about being mandated and required to pay the Mexican Mafia a portion of his drug profits. Eventually, it became a pattern, and the Mexican Mafia lost patience. He had a habit of not only falling behind and being late when it came to making his monthly payments, but he also had a tendency of testing the waters by trying to see what he could get away with. Almost as if he kept playing this game of holding out every month when it came time for him to pay. He didn't like to conform to what was being dictated to him, and he voiced this, but he was also smart enough to know when to stop pushing and when it was best to comply. From everything I was able to gather about Weddle, he wasn't into politics, but yet he loosely identified with being a Sureño. So after Shady and Diablo linked up, at one point, Shady advised Diablo about the details of the contract he had on Big Weddle. This is when they started to formulate a plan insofar as how they were going to take him out. Diablo technically didn't have to participate as it wasn't his contract, but I believe he agreed after Shady propositioned him and promised to get the green light on him rescinded if he assisted him in getting into the house. When it came to the killing part of it, Diablo didn't care about that as he had already had several murders under his belt, but I think he was a little apprehensive about whether or not Shady had the authority to get the green light on him rescinded. At any rate, Diablo agreed not only to get Shady into Big Weddle's house, but he also agreed to participate in the murder as well. As far as Diablo knew, Big Weddle was supposed to be the only target. But Diablo had been over to his house enough to know that there might be some collateral damage if he ended up having company. The other thing Diablo didn't know is that he also could have ended up being collateral damage himself. The plan was simple. Diablo was going to bring Shady to the house under the premise that he was someone he had known for a long time and that he was looking to score some drugs. Once they were invited in and the transaction was in process, this is when they pull out their weapons and execute Big Weddle. However, Shady was double dealing. 
On July 1st, 1997, Shady was with another individual who I refer to as Snoop. Shady had known Snoop for years and at one point had actually been in a relationship with his sister. Snoop is somebody who Shady also had an immense amount of trust in as well. In fact, he trusted him so much that he asked Snoop to drive him by Big Weddle's house so that he could kill him and possibly kill Diablo as well. Snoop was down with this and although he wasn't going to participate in the murders, he was going to drive Shady there, wait in the car and then drive him away once the murders were committed. Unfortunately for Shady, Snoop would later agree to cooperate and turn state's evidence against Shady and Diablo. Keep in mind that Shady wasn't the only enforcer that the Mexican Mafia sent to shake up Big Weddle. Several different crews were involved and they were all working independently. During the week before Spider Acosta and Big Weddle Dunton were shot, another MA enforcer who went by Boxer went to Weddle's house two days in a row. On the first visit, Boxer complained you ain't paying your taxes and they're getting on me because I'm not doing my job. The next day, Boxer returned with his old lady and another guy. He threatened Diablo who was also there with the machete while the other two held him back. He then took $100 and a small chrome handgun from Diablo. When Diablo complained about the gun, Boxer said, well, I'll give it back to you, but you better start taking care of your loose ends. Diablo then called someone in Wilmington and said he needed a gun any kind of gun and insisted that it was a matter of life and death. Around 20 minutes later, someone brought over a shotgun. With the assistance of another guy named Neto, who was also there, Diablo cut about six inches off the barrel and cut the stock off to make it easier to conceal. That same night before Spider Acosta and Big Weddle Dunton's murders, Neto and Diablo drove to a location in Wilmington known as the Third World or the Junkyard, a place widely known to be a high level drug dealing area. Even with all this going on, Diablo still needed to feed the gorilla he had on his back. When I say gorilla, I'm referring to his addiction. When they got to this place called the Third World, Neto flashed some money and offered to buy crack cocaine from one of the street dealers. When the dealer presented the drugs, Diablo drew the cut down shotgun and took the drugs without paying. That's what happens when you get caught slipping. After Diablo and Neto robbed this drug dealer, they drove back to Big Weddle's house. When they pulled up and Diablo seen a car that he knew was associated with Shady, he told Neto they sent somebody to fuck Weddle and Spider up. When they walked inside the house, Diablo seen Spider Acosta, Big Weddle Dunton, and Shady sitting in the living room. Diablo was caught completely by surprise, but he told Neto to sit down at a table. Diablo then placed the cut down shotgun on the table. Shady was seated on a small couch facing Weddle and held a different shotgun the weapon that Diablo referred to as Shorty. Weddle sat on a large couch facing the door and Spider Acosta was standing near the door. Although this fell outside the scheme of the plan Diablo and Shady had, Diablo figured he'd just follow Shady's lead and act accordingly. Neto subsequently left the room after asking if he could use the bathroom. Unfortunately for Diablo and Shady both, Neto would also later agree to cooperate and turn state's evidence. From the bathroom, Neto would later say that he heard Big Weddle say, if I gotta go, I'm gonna go like a man. Shady then said, you know the rules, and Diablo then chimed in following Shady's lead by saying, yeah, forward and backward. Diablo then said, don't point that at me, I don't like people pointing things at me. This is where things get sketchy. Neto overheard Diablo say, don't point that at me. But the only ones that were armed was Shady and Diablo. Was it at this exact moment when Shady had a brief fleeting thought of possibly taking Diablo out but then pulled back and changed his mind? This is up for speculation, but it sure sounds like it. The other thing to keep in mind is that Shady had one round in the small shotgun that they referred to as Shorty. Whatever the case was, Neto thereafter heard four gunshots, running footsteps, and a bump against the washing machine near the back door. Neto then exited the bathroom and went into the living room area where he saw Spider Acosta lying by the front door and Big Weddle Dunton seated on the couch with his head to the side. He had been shot in the head and had brain matter all over his shirt. Neto then ran out the back door and jogged down the street towards a convenience store to call 911. On the way, he passed a business where his friend worked and he went in and called 911. Neto would later testify that he was afraid to go back to Weddle's house because he figured they might come back and kill me. Snoop, who was waiting in the car for Shady, would later testify that he arrived at the house with Shady and that there were five or six other people there having drinks. Snoop also testified that he heard Shady say that Diablo was supposed to be collecting taxes for the Mexican Mafia 
and that neither Weddle or Diablo were paying up. On July 1st, 1997, officers from the San Pedro Police Department responded to a 911 call regarding a possible assault with a deadly weapon at a residence on West O'Farrell Street in San Pedro. After knocking on the front door and receiving no response, and after trying unsuccessfully to open the front door, the officers accessed the home through a back door and discovered two dead bodies inside. They found the body of Spider Acosta on the living room floor and the body of Weddle Dutton on the living room sofa. One of the officers testified that Spider Acosta's head was a very short distance from the front door. The second officer testified that four spent Remington shotgun shell casings, a bag of shotgun shells, the sawed off wood stock of a shotgun, a metal tube, drugs and drug paraphernalia, and a cell phone were all recovered from the scene. The cell phone was later traced to Raul Luna. If you guys remember in the first part of this story, I told you that Diablo used Raul's cell phone immediately after killing him. Diablo didn't only make the boneheaded mistake of using his phone, but he also held on to it and then later left it at another crime scene. After all this was said and done, when it came time to killing Big Weddle and Spider Acosta, Diablo pointed his shotgun at Spider Acosta and then shot him first. Shady then pointed his gun at Big Weddle but failed to pull the trigger. This raises a lot of interesting questions, but I'll get to that in a minute. So there was a brief second where Shady apparently hesitated and then failed to pull the trigger. Fearing that Shady wasn't capable of carrying out the murder and carrying through with his part, Diablo then turned his shotgun on Big Weddle and shot him as well. This was confirmed by not only ballistics, but also by Diablo himself. Why didn't Shady take out Weddle? This was his contract. He only had one round in his shotgun, and if he wasn't intending on using it on Weddle, then who was it for? Later, it was said that Shady was saving that round for Diablo, but for whatever reason, he didn't follow through with smoking Diablo either. Did he freeze up, or is there some other sinister reason? Shady did promise Diablo to get the green light rescinded on him if Diablo helped him gain access into Weddle's house. I personally think that Shady was playing him out of pocket and that this was all a ploy, but who knows? This story is so convoluted with so much backstabbing and double dealing that you don't know what to make out of certain things that happened along the way. Careful who you call your friends. So when Shady was arrested on the murders he caught with Diablo, he was housed in 1750, high power, where Puppet was at. For those of you who watched part one of this story, you might remember that Puppet was one of my sources who provided information for this story. When Shady landed in 1750, Dead Eye Eddie from Vario Nuevo Estrada had the county jail and was also housed right there in high power. Also present on the tier was Smiley from 8th Street, Indio from Rivera, Trigger from King Cobras, Santos from King Cobras, Silent from Blythe Street, Chato from Northside Pasadena, Bosco from Norwalk, Casper from Compton 7 O's, and a few others. Not to get off track, but I'll be running a story on Dead Eye Eddie sometime in the near future. Some of you might have known who he was, but this was Ernest Castro, Chuco's brother, the first Mexican Mafia member to turn state evidence in a RICO. Although Dead Eye Eddie continued to be embraced and continued to maintain his respect as a functioning member of the Mexican Mafia, this ended up putting him in a precarious predicament. This turned out to be a defining moment insofar as his loyalty to the Mexican Mafia. A lot of people were watching and wondering if he was going to honor his commitment as an honorable member of the Mexican Mafia by cutting ties with his brother Chuco, or if he'd falter and prove the old adage true about blood being thicker than water. Like I said, Dead Eye Eddie was respected and righteously liked, but according to his own homeboys from Vario Nuevo Estrada, over the course of time, Dead Eye Eddie faltered and began fraternizing with his brother Chuco. They ended up finding out and they took him out right there in the Estrada projects. So when Shady hit high power, he was still in good standings. And one of the first things he did when him and Diablo hit the county jail was to have Diablo whacked. I'm not sure where it happened or what part of the jail Diablo was in, but apparently he had him blasted several times. And nobody questioned Shady about pushing the line on Diablo at that time because as far as everyone there knew, Shady was still in good standings. At the time, most, if not all, the Grajadas were still good, but Shady ended up creating his own problems when he agreed to be interviewed at the Harbor Division. A few weeks after he landed in high power, long before anyone knew anything about the incriminating statements, he ended up exposing himself. Shady was smart enough to know that even if he was successful at knocking Diablo down, 
those police reports would still get disseminated somehow. Whether it's through a PI, a private investigator, or someone else who came into possession of those reports, sooner or later, they would have come out. These types of things always come to light. You might slip through the cracks for a while, but sooner or later, someone's going to expose you. He probably figured it was smarter for him to be proactive about it and at least try to address it on some level. I don't know if Shady was in damage control mode and trying to account for the things he said by being transparent or what his intentions were at that time, but at some point, he shot his paperwork to Silent from Blight Street. Silent had just been made by Alfred Salinas, Tigre from the Avenues, so he had the authority of an Emero. According to Puppet, Silent got at him not long after Shady sent him his paperwork and said, this city had just sent me his paperwork, and he's telling. The only reason why Deadeye Eddie didn't put things in motion himself is because they were saying that they were waiting for Shady to touch down in Pelican Bay and that they were going to handle it up there. Deadeye Eddie could have had Shady moved on right there, but he ultimately wasn't the one who pushed the issue. At any rate, Silent from Blight Street struck up a report on it and sent it to Thigre from the Avenues. I believe that this was around the time when Thigre was sold up with Tablas from Florencia. Even though Silent technically had the authority to sanction the hit himself, he probably wanted to run this through Tigre just based on the fact that this was one of the Grajadas. This was a family that still held a lot of sway within that organization at that time. So I'm sure Silent was probably a little intimidated and wanted to make sure he was covering his ass. Keep in mind that this was between 1997 and 2001. So the Mexican Mafia was still operating under the old set of rules, policies, and protocols. Shady wasn't a member himself, so he technically didn't fall under these protections. However, Shady was still as tapped in as anyone could be without being an actual member. In other words, they continued to rock him to sleep until they got clarification either way. Meaning, everybody had their game faces on. He was included in the guile or the roll call, and they interacted with him as they did with everyone else on the tier. Anyways, at some point, they got word back from Theater from the Avenues that they had two days to get Shady off the tier. Puppet said that Smiley from 8th Street, another up-and-coming Sureño who would later get made, was the one chosen by Silent to perform the deed. This is the same Smiley that was credited with also allegedly taking out Huero Verde from Verdugo. According to Puppet, him and Smiley were close and had a lot of history together, or as Puppet would say, he was like my kid. And because they were so close, Smiley told Puppet that he was the one selected to hit Shady. As I said in the first part of this story, Puppet looked up to Shady. He idolized this guy when he was younger and he wanted to be just like him. So when he caught wind of the predicament that Shady was in and what was about to happen, his heart was broken. He understood the dynamics of politics and how they were pushed, but he still felt bad for Shady. But when Smiley told Puppet that he was the one who was going to move on him, Puppet claims that Smiley was a little discouraged because of the flimsy weapon that they gave him to hit Shady with. Puppet said it was a tomahawk a comb with two dull razors melted into it. Puppet said Smiley showed him the weapon and said, I think they're setting me up. Puppet agreed that the weapon was garbage and advised Smiley against going forward with it. He told Smiley, don't trip, I got this, I'll take care of it. Puppet said that the piece was a joke and that it was an insult that they would even give Smiley a weapon like that. Not only that, but this was Shady Grajeda. He wasn't no slouch or someone who you'd want to come at with a piece like that. I'm sure that those of you who knew Shady would agree that Shady's not the type of dude you'd want to run up on half-cocked. He's a stocky dude, someone who you'd predict would more than likely try to fight back. At any rate, Puppet took it upon himself to step up to the plate and go to bat himself. And it must have been okay because Smiley or Silent didn't have an issue with it. But at the time, Puppet couldn't have possibly known that this would end up sabotaging his career. He said, once I stepped up and raised my hand to hit Shady, my career was basically over. I was just on borrowed time from that point on. So at that point, Puppet said that he started planning out the best option for whacking Shady. Jamming his door was something and then running out on the tier wasn't an option at that time because the deputies were on top of it and were double checking the doors. His plan was to wait until Shady was being escorted on the tier and then to reach out and grab him by the waist chains once he was directly in front of his door. Once he grabbed him by his waist chains, he then pulled him up close to his bars and start hitting him. So for those of you who have been to high power, you guys know that there's old school bars in front of the cells that you can reach through. Similar to San Quentin or Old Folsom. I don't know if they revamped or upgraded 1750 since the late 90s, but there used to be bars. There's also a plate glass window that has one way mirroring on it that runs the full length of the tier. 
This enables you to see the front of your neighbor's cells and a partial view of the tier. The plate glass window obstructs a small hallway behind it that's used by the deputies to walk down and look into the cells. They can see you, but you can't see them. It's like a catwalk. Part of Puppet's plan was to use this mirrored window to see Shady when he was coming and also use it to time the exact moment when he'd reach out and grab him by his waist chains. His opportunity actually came sooner than he had anticipated. That same day, they came on the tier to move Shady to 2904. 2904 is like another high power or a deep seg. There's only six cells back there and they're buried in that part of the jail. Coincidentally, after Shady had Diablo moved on several times, Diablo also ended up getting housed in 2904 as well. I don't know why they were moving Shady, but he was being escorted off the tier, so that was Puppet's only opportunity. When Puppet heard the chains rustling down the tier, he knew Shady was getting closer, so he posted up on his bars and he had his razor at the ready. As the chains got louder and Shady got closer, Puppet looked into the mirrored window until Shady came into view. Shady was sending his saludos to every cell he walked by and was completely oblivious to what was about to happen. When Shady finally stepped in front of Puppet's cell, Puppet reached out at the exact same time and grabbed Shady's waist chains. In one motion, almost simultaneously, he yanked him close to his bars while reaching out and slicing him in the neck. He obviously wasn't able to butcher him through the bars, but he managed to slice him once. Puppet said that Shady pulled away from him as soon as he got him and just kind of stood there with a hurt look on his face. Again, Puppet and Shady had known each other for years, and according to Puppet, Shady looked at Puppet as one of his little homies. So this obviously hurt him. The only thing that Shady said was, like that, like that. At that point, Puppet couldn't let up on him. He responded by saying something in Nahua that sounded like, Atusa Patusa, you ain't nobody special. This meant rat in Nahua. I'm probably saying it wrong, but that's how it sounded. Anyways, when Shady and Diablo were both convicted, Shady got life and Diablo ended up getting the death penalty. At some point after that, Shady caught a chain to Delano, which at that time was a reception center. So when Shady gets to Delano, he ends up going to D6, which was another ad say, and actually started going out to the yard with the active Sureños. According to Puppet, he was going out there for a while, but good news travels fast, especially when it's coming through the penitentiary grapevine. The active Sureños in that ad say caught wind that Shady was in the hat, so they ended up sending two shooters to hit him. They sent Wacky from Mesita and Grumpy from Northside Redondo. These two supposedly gave it to him pretty good and hit him something vicious on the hard yard as he left the yard with a bone crusher buried in his shoulder. For those of you who don't know what a hard yard is, it's basically a concrete yard in Adse. According to Puppet, Grumpy kept low bridging Shady taking his legs out while Wacky kept working him with the banger. But here's something else that has a cold twist to it, or as I say, one of the many moving parts of this story. So after Shady gets whacked, the Sureños obviously take him off the roll call and designate his cell as a dead cell, meaning that he's excommunicated and that nobody's supposed to fuck with him. But Shady still continued to covertly communicate with a Sureño named Toro from Northside Redondo. I guess Toro and Shady were doing this on the slunders, because none of the other Sureños knew about it. But the way they were doing it is through the assistance of the Norteños, who were also housed there in Adse. The Norteños would get these kites either from Shady or Toro and then deliver the kite to whichever one it was going to. But here's the cold part. The Norteños were copying everything they were writing to each other, and then they sandbagged all these kites. They sat on them. My guess is that they did this after hearing that Shady got taken off the roll call, and obviously after it became known that he had been hit on the yard. They shouldn't have got involved in their politics, but they obviously assumed that Toro was in violation for communicating with someone who was in bad standings. I know some of you are probably wondering why the Norteños did this or why they would involve themselves in someone else's politics. The best way of explaining this is that it's an unwritten rule that falls under the convict code. Despite the fact that the Norteños and Sureños were sworn enemies and irregardless of the fact that the war was still in effect back then, doesn't mean that they're exempt from following the convict code. What I mean by that is this, being that these guys were all active, the Norteños recognized that Toro was in violation and that he was possibly committing acts of treason. They obviously felt like this warranted taking the kind of action that they did. So the Norteños continued to pass these kites back and forth, but they just kept opening them, copying them, and then sealing them back up before they sent them to where they were going. 
So when Javier Marquez, gangster from the avenues, got there, another known Mexican mafia member, the Norteños sent him all the kites that they had copied and basically exposed Toro for what he was doing. In one of the kites, between Shady and Toro, Shady said something to the effect of, I don't know why Puppet did that, referring to the incident in the county jail when Puppet hit Shady. This is what ended up sabotaging Puppet's career. When Gangster seen this, he attributed this to Puppet, and this somehow got him caught up. Gangster also had Toro moved on for what was described as sharing data with the rat. His death row charging card says that he was convicted for six murders and that these murders were convicted in the course of collecting tax money for the Mexican Mafia. With a charging card like that, you would think he would be well received and that he would get high praise from the Mexican Mafia for having made the ultimate sacrifice. But if that's what Diablo thought when he got there, he was definitely in for a big surprise. Instead of being embraced, he would end up on a long hit list with the likes of Luis Pelon Maciel and Richard Primo Valdez, two other Sureños who were also given the death penalty behind murders they committed over unpaid tax money and for taking out a Mexican Mafia dropout. There would be no praise for Diablo and he wouldn't receive any warm welcomes when he first landed in San Quentin on death row. Instead, he would be assigned to a yard with the rest of the former Sureños who had become targets of the Mexican Mafia. Today, Diablo is a two-fiver. He's a member of a dropout gang who has declared unwavering war against its number one nemesis, the Mexican Mafia. Imagine that, after everything Diablo did in an attempt to win favor with the M.A. for all his sacrifices and all his achievements, he ended up becoming one of their biggest targets. And on the flip side, Diablo, who was once a loyal follower of the Mexican Mafia, ends up committing himself to a dropout gang who despises the M.A. And on the flip side, Diablo, who was once a loyal follower of the Mexican Mafia, ends up committing himself to a dropout gang who despises the M.A. It's a cold twist of an endgame by someone who believed that they were standing up for something righteous. Someone who was willing to sacrifice their own life for the things they glorified and once wholeheartedly believed in. I'm sure at some point while Diablo was sitting in his 4x8 foot cell on death row in San Quentin, that he realized that he went for the banana in the tailpipe and that he was fed to the sharks. But by then it was too late. Some of you youngsters out there who continue to glorify this lifestyle need to take notes and learn from the mistakes others like Diablo and Shady have made. I don't ever tell people who watch my channel not to commit themselves to organizations like the Mexican Mafia or the Nuestra Familia. It's not only my place not to do that, but I'm not an anti-gang activist. However, what I do advocate for is to at least give some of you youngsters the facts and all the information of what this lifestyle entails so that you can hopefully make well-educated decisions if and when the day comes where you consider taking a blood oath for membership. Be smart about the choices you make and don't allow yourselves to be motivated by something you think is worth glorifying. Because at the end of the day, when you're long forgotten after putting in all your work and that light bulb goes off in your cell, you're going to be the only one locked in there to lay in the bed that you made for yourself. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode of Paradigm Profiles. If you guys like this episode, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like this episode, give it a thumbs down. But either way, drop a comment and let me know what you think. As always, I want to thank all of you for tapping in and for continuing to support the channel. I have more stories dropping, so stay tapped in for the next one. I'm trying to elevate my game by getting these stories out faster, so just bear with me. Eventually, I'll get my rhythm. Just keep in mind that these episodes are so time consuming because of the research and effort I invest into them. Hopefully it shows. Also, for those of you who have been asking, Sandman is no longer part of the channel. He's been with Paradigm Media News for quite a while now, so it's obviously disappointing seeing him go. But we had a good run and the show must go on. Anyways, as this one goes out, I'm already working on the next one. You guys enjoy the rest of your week. This is your boy B and I'm out.